Mm. Oh, so this is, a, I, I would say it's a very unique experience going to the academia and then moving to the industry and then moving back to the academia. What do you think it was challenging that transition from academia to industry and then from industry to academia? V very challenging, but again, I had uh, uh, support, at least in the transition from academia to industry. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with somebody that I am still in touch with, uh, somebody who's quite senior to me. Uh, he is in Canada. I consider him one of my best friends. We talk almost once a month. Uh, his name is Andrew Lagowski. He was a senior post engineer. He had the practical knowledge which I lack. I had the fundamental knowledge which sort of complemented his uh, uh, us together as a team and we were extremely successful. I have, I'm proud to say that we were engaged in the five years in the design of over 20 wastewater treatment plants and none of them failed, not even a single one. And that's, I think, for a reason. I'm not saying that uh, we were super genius because the knowledge was out there, but I think the approach and the mindset. We approach these problems as dynamic problems. So we emphasized a lot on the definition of the problem, the establishment of, you know, a dynamic, variable design criteria so that we can encompass all the conditions that whatever plant we're designing had experienced 10 years in the last 10 years. So I think that was the key to success. And this is the exact same message that I give to every student or every aspiring engineer. You have to look at defining the problem very well. I think that is the most crucial part of the process design. Okay. I hope that's awesome. Being a professor for many years, um, definitely there, there are many activities being a professor. It's not one job. So you do research, you do teaching, you do service and, 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 and the others. What is the favorite part of being a professor? Research. I have to say hands down, I enjoy research, and I enjoy research for a reason. Uh, it's not that, you know, I tend to underestimate the importance of teaching, but I think uh, research to me is more problem solving, uh, finding new knowledge, always trying to overcome challenges, both uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, um, operational as well as scientific challenges so I enjoy research and frankly speaking this is the thing uh, surprisingly I've been doing this for a, a number of years and I still enjoy it today as much as I did the first time I wake up very early I try to sort of you know review the papers for my students encourage them also to think critically and write papers so that by far is the most important aspect of my I'm uh, sorry the most joyful aspect of my uh, job as a professor. So what is the least favorite part of being a professor? Uh, very honestly, uh, the least favorable part, uh, I think, to me is uh, uh, undergraduate teaching. And I think the challenge is, I mean, in graduate courses the students are very interested they know what they want and they are basically yearning to learn in undergraduate i i think that many of the students are there because they maybe started a program that their parents wanted for them there is no genuine interest to learn and even though our field is not rocket science i think it has got still enough complexities that if for somebody who's, who's uninterested, it can be challenging. So mm. to me, this, this would be the least popular aspect of my job. Other than this, I think I, I definitely enjoy my work. Okay. Um, I think now teaching for undergraduates is gonna change significantly after the pandemic and you know the, the online teaching is, is being a big part of the teaching model so hopefully that can help the teaser the very good. get engaged. The tea is good? Okay, yes. that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's good that we like our, our tea. Um, knowing that the revolution on the 
technologies and the advancement on the different aspects of the technology, like nowadays the artificial intelligence and the machine learning and all of those tools are playing a crucial role in all the aspects of our life and including the research. So could you please tell us about what are the main research areas that Dr. Nakhla is working on? Uh, as you know, I work primarily in two major research areas. Uh, the first deals with resource recovery from various organic wastes, uh, be it in the form of biogas, bioenergy, or even in the form of, you know, uh, carbon sources like volatile fatty acids, uh, even the form of, uh, you know, recovered coagulants. So resource recovery is one, one important area of my research. And frankly speaking, this, uh, most of my funding is in this area. The other area that is very close to my heart is biological nutrient removal, which I've been doing for, you know, a number of years. And uh, that, as you know, deals with, you know, second generation of uh, processes that remove nitrogen and phosphorus biologically as opposed to, you know, chemically and so on. And I think that area, I think uh, I like equally well to the biosolids area. So I would say my interest or my heart is 50-50 broken between the two. Okay. Do you think the AI will play a role or how do you see the integration of the artificial intelligence and the wastewater treatment research? Actually, I'm very glad that you asked this question. Uh, let me first start by telling you a story about the adoption uh, of technology in a conservative field like wastewater. Uh, I recall I was when I was working for a consulting company by the name of Conestoga Rovers and Associates, they are called GHD right now. Back in 1998, we designed, uh, we did process design for a very small plant, 130 cubic meters per day, it's called Heidelberg. And uh, the plant, uh, we instrumented it very well to the extent that the only operator time that was required was only for sampling. So basically, instead of having an operator there full time, we had an operator there go once a week, one hour, collect samples, and do some settling tests, and everything else was mm, automated through SCADA. And I recall very well the excitement of the president of the company, Frank Rovers, God rest his soul in peace. That. Uh, he called me to his office and said, George, we are into something huge. He said, what is huge? I was surprised. He said, you know what? We actually should be establishing an operating company. And with these sensors, with the with what you did at Heidelberg, we can save a lot of money and we can st still make a lot of profit. So I cautioned his, his enthusiasm and I said, we've been successful in this plan because this is a very small plan. You know, a couple of aeration tanks, and it's not too difficult to put in a couple of sensors. He said, no, 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 no. You know what? This could be applied at very, very large plants. He was even dreaming of applying this at plants the size of Toronto, which have, you know, eight or 12 aeration tanks, extremely long. You can't even ensure that there is uniform, um, uh, you know, mix and so on. The point that I'm trying to make is that I think we as humans get very uh, excited about new technologies and we tend to overestimate the barriers to penetration in conservative markets. So, having said this, I don't want to say that artificial intelligence is not going to play a role in wastewater treatment. I think it will. I think uh, uh, artificial intelligence could probably help us uh, optimize and do real-time real monitoring of physical and chemical processes. And the reason being that these processes, as you probably know, they are governed by reproducible, well-established mechanisms. So you're not dealing with dealing with anything that is live. I think there are two challenges that will face the integration of AI and wastewater treatment. I think one of them is the level of instrumentation that's needed and the data that is required, which I, I do not think uh, small plants can afford and as we know AI depends on developing a site-specific model 
validation of the model and then you know using it for process control so i think this will be one challenge i think the other challenge which is perhaps not surmountable by ai will be what happens in biological treatment and uh, as you and i know that uh, we some biological systems are not 100 percent reproducible there could be microbial shifts that cannot be predicted even with mechanistic models there could be change of kinetics that cannot be predicted with models or let alone you know a mathematical model that looks at the outputs versus the inputs and i think the other the the third challenge when it comes to biological treatment will be we know uh that some let's say microorganisms can exhibit multiple functions and they have different kinetics for the different functions and so under highly variable conditions i think it will be almost a challenge to predict what these can do based on data so i definitely see a role for ai but the will it overtake the biological wastewater industry no i don't think so I, I agree with you, it's not going to take 100%, or at least it's not ready yet, but there is always a, a place for improvement with time, but for future, I see there is a future for it. Maybe now it's partially, but that percentage will increase with, with, with time, not necessarily to be based on the mathematical equation models, but based on indicators, some, some indicators, and I got that soft uh, sensors that sensors. can give you some stimulation. Could be. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So you don't think, or do you think that is the AI can replace the process engineer? Or no, I I I, um, I strongly advocate against that because I think the AI is good, uh, perhaps for simulation. It may have limitations in design, but I think the AI would fail miserably in troubleshooting. Oh, fairly. Yes, I think troubleshooting is uh, uh, still more an art than a science, and it requires, you know, very adept uh, people, a uh, high level of uh, analytical skills. And I cannot basically foresee, for example, AI being able to uh, to predict the growth of filamentous organisms, as an example, okay, that would impact smell settling. So I, I still see that uh, process engineers' roles could be limited in the future, maybe not as much uh, design work as uh, they would like to, but I think in terms of, uh, uh, you know, troubleshooting, maybe a bit of optimization and so on, definitely we'll still need, we'll continue to need process engineers. Okay. Um, talking about um, yeah. a process that I know that it is close to your heart or your love, the fluorescent bioreactor. So what is that technology nowadays? What's the status of that? Uh, we've been doing, uh, we've been working for about 20 years on various forms of uh, uh, fluidized beds. We developed a technology called the circulated fluidized bed bioreactor, where instead of recycling liquids, we recycle biocarriers, and this way we can affect you know, nitrogen and phosphorus removal, much like in, you know, suspended growth system. Uh, and I think we've focused a lot on this technology and uh, ultimately the uh, uh, Achilles heel was energy consumption. So in the last five years, I've focused my attention more towards what we call inverse fluidized beds that are fluidized simply by the influent. They utilize light particles, but we're also realizing that there is a trade-off because on one hand, when we were dealing with heavier particles, they, had, they were uh, highly porous, um, uh, with a high degree of uh, surface roughness and accordingly accommodated significantly higher biofilms. Now we're dealing with lighter materials, plastics and so on. They, they can uh, entrain biofilms, but nowhere close to the thick biofilms that we were able to, uh, to generate with the uh, uh, regular fluid as bed. So it's a trade-off. It will be ultimately a trade-off between increased capital for this inverse fluid as bed and reduce energy consumption versus uh, higher capital for, you know, circulating fluid as bed. And, uh, sorry, lower capital for circulating fluid as bed and uh, uh, higher energy consumption. The technology, I would say, has not 
so far taken place or been applied widely in the market. I think we had just one relatively large installation in China. Uh, and uh, the technology right now, we've patented the technology to a Chinese company. Oh. So they, they are doing uh, you know, their own marketing.